Hello and welcome everyone to Active Lab. Today is May 6, 2021, and we're really excited to have Shauna Dobson back for MathStream 2.1. This is going to be a fun discussion, diamond holographic principle and D square emergent time. Maybe you'll teach us how to pronounce it and what it is. So thanks again for coming on this stream and really looking forward to it. So please take it away. Thank you so much, Daniel. I just want to say your community is so supportive and I'm so happy to be back for a second talk. You are all working on some of the most you know, profound ideas um, here. And so I'm really excited and thank you for having me. Yay, all right. So this talk, I'm going to go a little bit into the more like the diamond part because I got some feedback on what are these diamonds and what was she talking about? And so I was really excited that D square is actually D diamond for emergent time. So um, if I, I'll try to do my best to lay all these out. Please ask, um, like Daniel was saying, questions every you know 10 slides or something like that. I'm happy to answer it. Um, I'm also trying to constellate and weave together this sort of kind of grand unified picture. So um, there's some drawings in here and I hope that it's uh, fun. Okay, so uh, let's, let's go. Um, I'll be talking about the diamond holographic principle and D-diamond emergent time. Yay. Okay, so the goal. I sort of talked about this last time, but not too, too in detail. Um, today I'm gonna actually weave together this kind of new math with uh, active inference and let's try to put it together and all work together. So the goal is like to take the holographic principle, which we're, you know, um, um, all aware of, uh, which was like begotten by um, Maldacena's, uh, you know, uh, beautiful gauge gravity duality between anti sitter space and conformal field theory. I have an idea to sort of reinterpret it in terms of continuous K theory and something I'm going to call pro-emergence. So a pro object is um, um, a specific object kind of in, um, in category theory that's being used everywhere. And it's sort of this idea of sewing together a bunch of um, kind of smaller things that are self-contained to get a grand object. And it's sort of built into the very structure. I thought, oh, this is a great idea. So I talked about K theory a little bit last time, which is this beautiful construction by Grothendieck to actually look at um, classifying very difficult objects using isomorphism classes of the spaces. So it's like, oh, we can tell if two spaces are equivalent based on their equivalence relations. And I thought that's a very, very, very nice higher uh, way of looking at things. And there's a new work uh, by Efimov talking about continuous K-theory. So again, this idea of sort of sewing together maybe smaller K-theories to build a bigger uh, object. So for this pro-emergence, right, I am fascinated by time and I want us to kind of get into it, right? How does active inference see these, uh, these sort of time streams? Like, are there little local times with little thicknesses around them? What is this? So in this, this idea of mine, this pro-emergence, you have a doubly emergent time that's emergent on two fronts. So um, you have a local singular condensed time, which is sort of the time that we all experience. It's very like, you know, I'm presenting to uh, your lovely community, 9.06 a.m. This is like Shanna's now, right? But there's also like, you know, Alpha Centauri now and the unicorn constellation now, right? So there's all these different nows and whose now is what? <laughs> so you have these like local singular time and then you're gonna have, actually have this global, what I'm gonna try to push for is a non-locality in the diamonds. So um, to rephrase the holographic principle and uh, kind of upgrading ADS, which is anti sitter space, which is the bulk, uh, which has gravity in it. I'm gonna try to actually rebuild that from the six functor formalism. So that's what you see in this figure with these um, sort of six columns is the six operations uh, from Peter Schulze's Atel Cohomology of Diamonds. It's so beautiful. So imagine building space from a functor formalism, which is a uh, very, very specific. And then, um, um, if you're gonna get the conformal field theory, which has no gravity. Um, I was thinking, okay, so the gravity list should, could be in the profinite condition of the diamonds. So you see, I have a bunch of diamonds kind of glued together. And so maybe this gluing in the diamond condition can kind of you know replace the conformal field theory. So in this, um, you can actually get a, a holography. And it's really interesting to think what active inference thinks about uh, holography, like what's the actual um, reflection, what's the actual object. So you can relate this to strong and weak coupling, you know, uh, whichever theory is strong, right, has a strong coupling, which is like, you know, the tension, um, um, you know, in the interaction terms. And um, so you can relate, you know, 
you know, whichever one, you know, has maybe a, a weaker coupling, you normally use like a perturbation theory. The stronger coupling, you have to use the non-perturbation methods. So it's very physics oriented. Um, and, you know, the beauty and the duality is that if one space is too hard, you go to the other space. So this is really fun. And this is in um, the, I sort of have this grand opus paper, uh, the DOB 21. You're like, she refers to it all the time. <laughs> okay, so the goal, right? So I said, you're gonna have this pro-emergent thing, which is like, has multiple emergent times going on. It's not just emergent time, but I think they're all over the place. So in that is what I'm gonna call V stack time. So um, a stack is going to be this particular object that takes um, values in categories, not just sets. So we're not looking at like the set of continuous functions, but maybe you're looking at the category. Um, of, you know, of continuous functions and every object in the category is a continuous function. So you're getting this sort of grand unified view um, of, of objects, which is really, really neat. I say V because it's, it's going to be a stack in, with a V topology on it. Um, I think I spoke last time that you can actually put a topology on categories and that's what I'm really interested in. So the V topology is uh, Peter Schulze's um, topology that he's using for the diamonds and it's um, it's a nice fine topology and I'll go into it in a little bit. So the big questions that are driving some kind of, you know, wild diagram that I have here in the middle, this con D diamond is like, what is the mathematics of simultaneity? So I'm really interested in what we mean by simultaneity. When we say two events happen quote at the same time, what time is that? Um, and is there a difference and what is the difference between simultaneity and non-locality? Non-locality, you know, uh, you have spatial non-locality, maybe the view from a pair of entangled photons. Um, and then what does temporal non-locality mean? That time is actually everywhere, that there is no difference in time between events, right? You have events that are maybe spread out into space, but maybe they happen at the same time. So I'm really interested in what kind of mathematics would be able to hold something like that, right? Maybe you have a bunch of multiplicities going on, but they're all at once. So, um, you know, I'm asking what is embodied cognition in non-locality? How could you actually reframe one of the fundamental tenets of like active inference based on like reframe it in non-locality, not a progression, but what would actually happen all at once? So this is where I think, um, you know, the mathematics would actually help like infinity categories and this double emergence that I'm talking about. So I talked about infinity categories last time. These are um, categories that have a lot of, a lot of rich structure in them and you're able to create morphisms uh, between morphisms and between morphisms all the way up to infinity morphisms, which is really, really beautiful. So maybe the claim, maybe it's kind of a wild claim is that embodied cognition like is emergent time, right? So um, what am I gonna, you know, hopefully that's something that can I can kind of show throughout these slides. Embodied cognition like is um, emergent time. So again, the basis behind emergent time is, was it always here? I don't, I, I don't know. Was time always here? Who knows? And that's what I'm kind of after. So in this diagram, you see I have this spa FQ, which is the attic spectrum I'm going to go into. On the other side, you have spa QP, which is the attic spectrum of the P attics, the diamond interpretation with the little diamond on top. You've got these two factorization maps, these XBs from Farg's work on his geometrization of the local Langland. So heavy math in this, um, which is really beautiful. On the bottom, you've got this Y diamond SE. These are... Um, this is called the diamond interpretation of the farg fontaine curve. This is an attic curve that has a, an actual Frobenius action on it. And so this curve is very important. It's used in uh, the Langlands program, which is a, you know, a the top a grand unified theory of mathematics right now. So then you have these LN maps that are mapping up, <laughs> whatever up means, uh, into what I call condensed D diamond. So the condensed category is uh, Peter Schulz's construction about category of condensed objects. I'm going to go into those. It's a beautiful idea about sheaves over points. So anybody in the crowd who knows what a sheaf is, it's like an awesome topological way of keeping track of local data, local data, local data, local data, like a little bag. And um, so I can like, normally um, you, don't, you have sheaves over spaces, but here's an actual sheaf over a singular point. And so he's, uh, he and um, uh, um, Dustin Clausen have been like putting together this really um, awesome uh, lecture notes on this topic. So it's great. It's in its infancy and I think it's great. So that D diamond is um, a conjecture of mine that you take the diamond that I talked about last time and you can actually extend it to the infinity category of diamonds. So I call that D diamond. A lot of stuff in that diagram, but this is, you know, what I think is actually the aesthetic uh, because it, you know, what if we could actually map this to like, um, you know, a, a string theoretic interpretation or something. Then you get the grand unified theory of math and physics. Boom. Okay. So, um, 
let me open that just a little bit. So if you take, uh, let C be the category of diamonds, let condensed C be the category of condensed objects in C. Objects are condensed diamonds, right? That's what's in there. Um, let R be the reflective full subcategory of condensed C. This is a subcategory where all objects in R are actually reflections of uh, objects in uh, the bigger category. So it's very neat. You have diamonds and their reflections. So objects in R are reflections. So if you take D diamond to be the infinity one category of diamonds, you can extend this to con D diamond. So condensed D diamond, and you get this actual um, object. So following precedent from Farg's amazing work, uh, the fiber product of this diagram is claimed a moduli space and a diamond. That's very hard. <laughs> Right, so uh, that's uh, that's hard. <laughs> so moduli of V stack time. So let's take this condensed diamond and just up it just a little bit. So I have this other conjecture, right? <laughs> let's take um, so the way that you get these diamonds. Oh, I don't have the figure. All right, I have the figure of a diamond very very soon. The way you get the diamond is by taking equivalence classes, uh, certain Proatel equivalence um, classes of. Um, these objects called perfectoid spaces, which are like Berkovich spaces, kind of like Cantor objects. And so you glue those together and you get a diamond. Well, why don't we glue diamonds together and get something else? So you can do that. So if you can take um, diamond equivalence relations of this diamond curve, then you can get a stack and the V topology. And then why don't we work in the moduli space of V stack? So moduli space is this awesome parameter space where each point represents an isomorphism class of objects. So you're looking at, so each point, like in this little figure below, um, is uh, an isomorphism class. And so the question is like, uh, you know, how do you move in a diagram like that? Is it a chessboard? Is it, can I only move this way and this way and this way? So I'm really interested in like what it means phenomenologically to have something like this and to start in the upper left, like dot and jump to the, like the bottom right dot. So how do you actually move through this thing? So I'm thinking that every point of that moduli space would actually be an incarnation of the condensed D diamond diagram. So that that huge factorization with these maps um, would actually be uh, each point. And I think that's actually really beautiful. So that's the type of like grand unified theory I'm kind of thinking of. Um, yeah. So these LN maps play a dual role of what's called topological localization. Localization is a beautiful phenomenon, uh, a beautiful way of actually constructing equivalences between um, uh, between objects. And so topological localization passes through this reflective subcategory. So objects are being sort of stared at by their reflections, and it's a way of getting more equivalences and maps. So I'll just leave that at that. So this pro terminology, this is a little mathy, but I thought, you know, we're, let's do it. I'm not going to go super mathy, but I wanted to give you enough terms so you know, like what I'm talking about. So for this pro, um, which I think is very cool. The idea is that emergence is built into the very space as a pro object and not as additional counter terms. I think the AI community, the active inference community does that as well. Um, you want everything sort of built into the structure as opposed to adding these uh, counter terms. There's a lot of beautiful like Feynman path integral work that has all of these, these additional counter terms um, added to it. And it's like, well, I wish it could just be built into the actual space. So you can actually do that with this pro terminology. Right, so a pro object, all this is, um, there's a great reference called in cat lab that has all these definitions. So I'm pulling all these um, and lots of great lecture notes on any kind of pro object. So what is a pro object? A pro object of a category C is a formal co-filtered co limit of objects of C. So basically roughly um, what we mean by this co-filtered limit is that for every two objects, C1, C2, and C, you have a third object, C3 and C, that they both get mapped to it. So it's sort of self-contained. You see it's built into the structure. You don't have to go off and leave the category to find the limit. So you have a Hom functor um, um, also. So what do you do? You take S to be a closed symmetric monoidal category. Closed, um, I have the definition for both of these. Symmetric monoidal means it has a tensor product. And you take C and S in rich category, which means that it takes values. Um, the Hom set of C takes values in S. So you have this enriched Hom functor, which is written like this. C takes in two pairs. Um, going from the product of C opposite with itself, where C opposite is the same category, the, the arrows are just reversed, to S um, that sends a pair of objects in C to this HOM object, which is a collection of morphisms. So look at that. You're actually mapping um, each pair of objects to where it can go, right, to all the possible paths. And I think this is very nice.
So a closed category means for any pair um, CC prime of objects, the collection of morphisms is an actual object of C. So everything is inside of itself. And um, it's sort of like a categorical closure property, right? If anyone's familiar with just the closure property of um, um, that you learn in like, you know, abstract algebra. So this is called the internal HOM object. Right, so um, five, the profunctor. So with the pro terminology, you can actually have a profunctor, which generalizes the word uh, term functor. So let C and D both be enriched over C, the profunctor from C to D is an S functor, so it's enriched uh, with D op, um, tensor C over S. So again, taking the pairs and mapping them over. So you can also make this into, like I told you, this moduli space, right, right here with the points where isomorphism classes um, are, are each point, and they can vary geometrically. And I'll go into what that means. Um, and you can get stacks from that. So I think I'll finish the pro and then ask if there's any questions, Daniel, just to wrap up this, this pro. Okay, before I, yeah. <laughs> let's get the super techie stuff out of the way. <laughs> um, all right, so what's also beautiful and uh, all over the Langlands program is the idea of a pro finite group. So you can, either, you can take this pro language this kind of multi-gluing and self-containedness and extend it to a profinite group, which is a topological group that's isomorphic to the inverse limit of an inverse system of discrete finite groups. So you have this inverse limit over the discrete finite groups. These are finite groups that they all have the discrete topology and you have a collection of homomorphisms that satisfy nice relations. So my idea is like, okay, let's, let's, let's up the game even more. Um, there's a lot of work about spectra and prime spectra, and this is also Groth and D, where the spectrum of a ring, I think I talked about it last time, um, uh, is a certain, um, the spectrum of a ring refers is a space where the actual points of the space refer to prime ideals. So again, you have this like point referring to something higher than a point. Okay, so you can extend that to what are called a formal spectra. So Groth and had this great idea of like including infinitesimals in things. So it's not like you have a singular now, but what if we had a singular now with a little bit of infinitesimal thickening on it, right? Like every, every now or every like local time of ours had a little bit of thickening and we could call that an infinitesimal thickening. And so um, he actually has the same idea and he calls it formal spectra. So we say the formal spectrum spuff R of a uh, commutative ring R and a, an ideal that obeys certain properties. It's actually the inductive limit of the prime spectrum. So inductive limit um, meaning like this. So uh, the, the pro refers to a projective phenomena and the end refers to an inductive. So it's like a co-limit. So spuff R is the co-limit of spec R um, I N which is um, the, where R is complete with the I-adic topology. There's various ways of completing rings in the I-adic. So um, where the connecting morphisms are these closed nilpotent immersions, spec R, uh, I, N, uh, immersed um, with spec uh, R, I, N plus one. So these are of affine schemes and the colon is taken in the category of topologically ringed spaces. So uh, what, is a, what is a closed nilpotent Im immersion? So a nilpotent phenomena is some property that, you know, you take an element, raise it to a certain power and eventually go to zero. So it's a way of canceling out elements. Uh, the affine scheme is a ringed space. It's a topological space and it has um, 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 a structure sheath, which is again, this kind of thickening thing. So imagine a space with a little bit of like skin on it. And so I'm thinking that, okay, it's not just a pro-emergence of points, it's a pro-emergence of these formal spectra, which are like times intervals with little thickenings on them. So nilpotent elephants, uh, did I say elephants? <laughs> Nil nilpotent elephants, nilpotent elements are, um, are infinitesimal neighborhoods. And so a beautiful um, uh, way to complete, uh, again, to complete the ring, you know, having convergence issues like settled is to actually take attic completion. So attic completion is to actually have all the infinitesimal neighborhoods at once. And I think that's a grand goal. And anybody after attic completion to have all the thickenings, right, um, is what is probably what we should be after. Any questions on that so far before I get to the fun? Just I, I, Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for this um, interesting intro. I think one yes. thing that's really going to resonate with people, hopefully of all different backgrounds, is what you said about we want emergence built into the base structure of our model not a, a counter term, which isn't a, a term that's familiar to me, but it's kind of like magic shouldn't be added at the higher level. We should have a model where at the base level we have emergence. And then you um, mentioned the pairs of objects and a few different kind of pair operations like inverses. And so I was just wondering, how should we think about 
these pairs of objects, for example, are they organisms in the niche? Or are they two organisms? Because if so, then we can kind of think every time you say pair, we might be able to like map it onto something that, that we're, we've talked about from the embodied cognitive perspective. Oh, I like that. Yeah, go ahead. Try that. Try that. Um, you know, well, you could take, you know, the category C of organisms and then it could be um, any two organisms in the actual category. If you wanted the category, you know, to be, um, you know, pairs of organisms like uh, the organism Daniel and the organism Shanna or something different, then you could actually construct the category to be that. That's the beauty of category theory. Hmm. You construct it to be whatever you want because structurally, you know, the goal. The goal is to get everything built inside the actual space and to have these consistency issues that you're not like, oh, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, so like uh, we come online and then there's this counter term, <laughs> oops. <laughs> so you actually have it um, where organism, you know, is relating to or interacting with like organism, right? Or you could actually have the category be just the way that my organism is identifying and interpreting information. Like whatever you want those objects to be, it's completely loose. Cool, thanks. And I'll relay any questions from live chat in mm -hmm. another 10 slides. <laughs> Yay, awesome. Okay, this is so great. Yay. So we're all on the same page. Um, you know, built it, build it into the structure, you know? And if, if you want the structure centered around, you know, you can actually have this C3 being like the organism Daniel, the organism Shanna, that everything maps back to me because that's what we're doing, right? In active, everything comes back to me. I'm trying to process. Um, okay, cool. All right. So, um, Okay, this is a, I don't know, these, these ideas may just all be wild, but I'm glad, you know, I'm here to help. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know, this is where my brain thinks. Okay, so we have the idea of an infomorphism, which is an actual pair of, uh, an adjoint pair of functors that's on a, a chew space. And my colleague, my great colleague, Chris Fields, has done so much work uh, with that. You know, Chris Fields pairs with uh, um, Levin all the time. They come up with this great stuff. So an infomorphism is one pair, one set of adjoint uh, functors, which, um, um, which satisfies some information. My idea is to make a two infomorphism from these six functor formulas. So in these kind of wild equations down here, the two tails is, is a, a structural property, an internal hom and an actual tensor product, how you actually combine things. But the four in the middle represent two pairs of adjoint functors. So if one set of two pairs is infomorphism, I just want to actually construct a two infomorphism, which would actually be a morphism between morphisms. So that's a categorical thing at this point. We're working on the semantics of what that actually means right now. Um, and so bear with us, that should be out very, very soon. Um, so what is this? The idea is the incarnation of global time emerges from diamond non-locality. That's what I just tried to say. Local time emerges from these singular condensed sets. The two infomorphism is going to connect the global time with the local time. That's the whole point, right? That's how your organism evolves, right? Uh, that's how you deduce, is to connect your local time with what's actually happening globally, right? These cannot be singularly, they have to intersect at some point. So if this two infomorphism can actually do that, then you can actually get this temporal simultaneity non-locality. I'm still not convinced that there is a difference uh, between simultaneity and non-locality. I would love it for anyone in your, um, you know, if anyone's um, like interested in that. That's, that's really, that's tricky because uh, maybe, maybe the instance of simultaneity is a slice of the non-locality. Or maybe we were actually in tune enough with what's happening like, um, like embodied cognition wise or whatever, that we were actually able to access for just a second, maybe the true non-locality of everything that is, the non-locality of information, whatever you want to call it. What is the difference? I don't really know. Uh, people normally refer to like special relativity and reference frames. And I, I um, have a couple questions about what reference frames are. So um, anytime, you know, I, I think I'm going to tackle a new subject, I invent a new dictionary. I'm like, okay, let's start with a dictionary to actually translate what I'm talking about. Okay, so the notion of a site in category theory is where I can put a topology. So I'm thinking if I'm, you know, for instance, looking at the site over, you know, organism, you know, investigating its environment, something like this, the site of Shanna, um, that could, in, that's a categorical, categorical way of actually um, referring to the localization phenomena in the collapse, right? So if quantum mechanics is saying you, you go from, you know, the collapse of the wave function is uh, great. I go from a simultaneous like superposition state to like a localized now. 
course, there's, you know, um, controversy about the collapse and things like that. That's why I'm using the word localization. You localize in the now. So um, coupling perturbation, right? So again, strong coupling, you have to use these, um, um, these non-perturbative methods. Weak coupling, you can use perturbation. There's a, I think there's a link between perturbation and this perfectoid stuff that I've been looking at. So there's a way called uh, called tilting to go from uh, characteristic zero, if people are familiar with that, to characteristic P. You can also add these beautiful objects called uh, P divisible formal group laws, uh, which are, um, uh, you know, once again, uh, I would say ways of connecting like groups. Um, the kernels of these actual maps are P to the N torsions. So the torsion element um, actually annihilates any other element. So an element is torsion if it actually um, is annihilated by another element. So you can see that you have these P to the N sort of phenomena that are canceling terms. So the whole idea is that you can get this cancellation and sort of a sequence phenomena um, also in perfectoid spaces. So there's also torsion in the, these objects called Shimura varieties, which we'll talk about later. That's in the Langlands conjecture. Strong coupling, maybe it's strong, uh, you know, maybe in the diamond, we could say strong coupling is in the diamond side of the holography uh, because there's many incarnations of these covers, SPA, CD. And I'll go into this a little bit later, just trying to put the ideas up front. Weak coupling, right? So maybe you can do perturbation phenomena um, in the condensed setting, uh, in the interior, um, you know, so maybe that's in the singular perfectoid time. It's weak because it's, uh, you know, condensed. Maybe it's easier to work with Proatel covers than the, in the condensed setting. So it would make you work in the conformal field theory, which is the diamonds. So the whole relation to the diamond holography is that if you have these six operations right in the bulk, then you're going to have to go from the bulk to the conformal field. So maybe the inside is the six operations, uh, you know, um, whichever one you want to call strong and weak coupling. So what do I what do I need to finish? Well, you need to like to I need to actually take the six operations and put them in the condensed setting. <clears throat> and then link the diamond profinite conditions with non-locality. So you get what's called diamond descent. Descent is another way, uh, like Daniel was saying, about keeping the, the system contained. Descent is a way of actually making sure that the covering spaces can, can reconstruct the lower space. So my local space is actually constructible from my, glo my global space and vice versa. This is another way of keeping the structure built inside the actual space. OK, and we'll talk about diamond localization, which is going to be a way to make relations between the various diamonds. All right, so well, let's try to link this, right? So recall an infomorphism. It's an adjoint pair of structure preserving maps for a Chu space. The beauty about Chu space is that it's got a very, very nice construction categorically. The Chu construction build, builds what's called a star autonomous category. This is a monoidal category. It has a tensor product in there to help, help you move nav objects around where all objects have duals. Right. So I thought this might be interesting from embodied cognition, because maybe you're looking around at your reflection and learning off of your reflection. Right. And where are these reflections? Everywhere. So if all objects have duals, it's a very strong property for a category, which is why there's a lot of type theory and stuff that works in the choose space. So you also have a category of Frobenius algebra. This is an associative algebra with a linear form on it. Um, I told you Frobenius was even in the Langlands. Right. So Frobenius is powerful. Um, in body cognition, everything is related, right? So you want everything to be related. So what if, what if everything was a star autonomous category? So I think the Chu construction is actually very pertinent here. So if the hidden states, what if those are like a pro-finite condition or a pro-object that maybe just only become, uh, you know, uh, visible upon a certain pullback? So in the diamond construction that I gave you, I said those, those geometric points were mathematical impurities, yeah, that they were not visible unless you pulled them back over these covers. There's, once again, a lot of work um, ne about neurology um, acting topologically, meaning that you, your proprioception is gotten by these topological covers where portions of the mind or the brain are actually working uh, together um, and where, where, where portions sort of intersect and overlap. That's a, that's a covering phenomenon, and that's how you actually um, deduce and things like this. So shared action. Okay. Okay. So if we were, if we're after shared action, you know, what if we start looking at relations between relations? That's where the shared action is. We want to think collectively. Yeah. In the face of uncertainty, if we start thinking in the framework of two morphism, then you're already in the global space. And I think there's nothing more shared than working in the relation of the relation space instead of being so siloed. You can be siloed in your own localization. But that's not going to help for shared action. 
you need to actually so if everyone can get a hold of everyone else's two morphisms <laughs> you know what does that mean and that means that you're actually all intersecting and interacting um you can take that and go to in awareness which is what uh, my awesome colleague uh, robert prentner and i've been working on as well that you know I, I i'm not sure i think i said that last time that i do not believe that there's only one channel here right i feel like through uh shared action you could access more of these sort of consciousness channels. Um, and so the in awareness is actually a categorical phenomenon that I can show here. So I think I showed this the last time, but I'll just show it again. So on the left, you have a basic uh, depiction of a category, this one right here. My little mouse is like not working. All right, so the one on the left, <laughs> uh, top row left. <laughs> um, so you have um, two, um, two objects here, A and B. F1 and G1 are morphisms, right? You have two objects, C and D. Um, F2 and G2 are, those are morphisms. We'll call them one morphisms. Let's go to the category in the middle. So the category middle is a two category. Oh, and I'm sorry, the category on the left is a one category. So if you go to a two category in the middle, you have the same objects, A, B, C, D, and the same one, one morphisms, but look at these wild maps on the side. So you're mapping, uh, look, where, look what we're mapping on the left. You're mapping the morphism F1 to G2 by that map phi. And then you're also by gamma, you're mapping uh, G, uh, G1 to F2. So this is awesome. So look what we're doing there. Now you're mapping the morphisms between the morphisms and this is where I think shared action lives. You can go even wilder because you know, it's me. <laughs> um, so the third, <laughs> the third you can have a three category, um, which is the top right piece. And look at that. A three category consists of objects, one morphisms between the objects, two morphisms between the one morphisms, and then look at the three morphism you have going on. The big double bar, uh, triple bar, hor um, horizontal bar that's connecting phi and gamma. Is that right, C? So you see, you can just keep going. And why not? That's where but, collection... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, just wanted to give one little thought on this. It's almost like, yes. let's say A, B, C, D are people. And then... Yes. The two mapping is kind of like best friends or marriage. It's like two people who are married, there's some parallelism between couples of married people. And then the three is like the mapping between marriage and being a best friend. And so it's like saying the relationship between person A and B in the marriage is like the relationship between A and B in the best friend relationship. So it's like we can put the relationship and almost objectify it, but not in a... a demeaning way, just in a containing formal way, and then use that to build higher order relationships. So this is like very interesting. Look at that. Yeah, you say it. I should just give you my slides and you present. <laughs> it's a co it's a co presentation. And we as an yes. as a dyad are interacting with the material you've prepared as well as any questions that anyone else brings. Wow. And so does everyone see so like collectively oh that makes me excited so collectively like even this interaction is like a three morphism right now and so that's actually really cool and you see um i like the yeah the with like marriage maybe you know maybe if you stayed in the one category you would have just been friends and you would have never actually tried the other relationship or the other relationship or you can go like you know twin flames and all this kind of stuff and so it's actually really exciting and so you can see just like daniel's saying that's shared action and let's like let's take shared action to infinity and then what a beautiful place this would be you know you can kind of have like you know the people like me that are you know uh, related to animals too so it'd be like oh okay so then you have the morphism between like the theta wave of the animals talking to like the humans and then like oceans and things like that and then you might start relating on the higher like higher um, connection level right not hierarchical but like a higher connection level and so you can see that uh, robert and i were trying to think okay Let's let's get weird and like take you know the one level of awareness which is like uh, you know Daniel and I co-presenting here because he's says my slides better than me <laughs> so the co the, the co-presentation right is maybe like a one awareness okay and then two awareness let's let's just bump this up a little bit would be that you know he and I are presenting here and then simultaneously like we're both Cambridge apostles what yes that's the level that I'm willing to go right? Because if time is non-local, which I sort of think it is, why can't we map to it using these morphisms, right? Of course, we'd have to do, I don't know, some kind of partition in the brain or whatever, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> but that's what we're saying about this nested hierarchy. So use the same, uh, everything that Daniel's saying about the categories, right? One category, two category, three category, 
and bump it to like awareness, meaning actual interaction. Like let's take embodied cognition and bump it. Like what would a two embodied cognition be? A three embodied and let's keep going up because that would require higher, higher levels of this awareness, this stacky thing. And again, the beauty about this is that, look, we didn't add some counter term, right? We didn't just add, a, you know, the whole thing is magic, of course. And, you know, I love magic, but we didn't just add it out of nowhere. This was like built into the actual structure, which I think is cool. So again, most people may be um, intimidated by category theory or whatever at the first, but it's like, I think there's a payoff. It's like, let's, let's put a little bit of work into that structure. And then you can make this aesthetic and it actually, I think it helps, you know? So um, just an overview real quick. I'm, I'm going to try to talk about this, uh, you know, this emergent time a little better and a concomitant theory of condensed types, which are proposedly, they're supposed to be immediate from the recently introduced diamond holographic principle. You've seen me already kind of introduce that. So if you're connecting this beautiful mathematical grand unified theory of uh, geometrized local languages in the stack uh, language with emergent time, that would be a new incarnation of a new reciprocity law. You see, I'm using the word incarnation to refer to diamonds and reflections. Yeah. Um, also, choose spaces, infomorphism, star autonomous, all of this, star autonomous, objects having duals, reflections, reflective subcategories, profinite condition. It's all about the mirror phenomena, which is in embodied cognition, I think. Of course, there's problems everywhere, which is why I'm excited about this, right? Problems everywhere, you know? You're going to talk about a theory of emergent time. How do you measure that? How do you actually measure time without constructing it? And that, that is like, that's huge. That'll stump me, you know? I talk fast. I'm like, wait, wait. So how do you, how do you measure a double emergence? Something as crazy as I'm talking about. How do you measure a pro-emergence? How do you measure like a, you know, if you want to do this categorical construction like we're doing, a two emergence, a three emergence. I don't know. And that's what I hope to, so like we can all work together and figure this out. How do you actually measure emergence? It's like, do you collapse emergence? Are you too late? If you measure it too early, is it a partial emergence and you've missed it? If we sneeze, do we miss it? Is it fast? You know? So our model gives levels of uh, non-locality, levels of non-locality, not just saying like, you know, there, there exists a spatial non-locality. No. If you can put them together in that formal spectra, what if you had levels of non-locality everywhere? And that's sort of what I'm into. So I call it like a stacky non-locality and stackification. I think the, stackification is a word like spaghettification. It, do, it does exist. <laughs> I may have misspelled it. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So you can do local, this you know, I'm interested, um, one of your um, awesome um, um, members of the community was asking me about like, what, what are you talking about this local global? Meaning like the local singular now is like where I'm existing now. And then of course, you know, you have your unicorn constellation time on a Saros and all this other stuff. So that's what, there's a play here between taking in information and then like existing and stuff. So you can do this by this diamond descent. I told you this gluing, and that's gonna be an infinity one version of spatial V descent, which is at Peter Schloss's work diamond localization. So what's already neat is that, once again, when I talked about the emergence is built into the structure, this localization, those L maps in the reflective subcategory, it's already a descent condition. Whoa. So let's use these beautiful theorems, right, and actually use them for phenomenology. For phenomenology. And so that's already a descent condition, so we're on our way, you know? So the goals to actually link like strong and weak coupling, how do you actually construct this diamond non-locality for a temporal multiplicity? I think that's really in tune with embodied cognition is to have a multiplicitous time, meaning like there is not just one, but it's what, how could you actually model time acting globally, non-locally, but also in a multiple way? And that's super French continental philosophy at that point. And I, you know, that's like my upbringing. So I'm really interested in this phenomenal multiplicity because it le it lets the individual be and it makes like what embodied cognition is like what I feel it is. So I'll have to build this diamond descent and then again these V stacks are going to have to satisfy this gluing condition that's fine. Our model is a double emergence, but it's profinitely many copies of emergence. That's what's strange. I told you last time a profinite set was a totally disconnected compact Haus um, Hausdorff space. So that's uh, that's uh, what? Like what is that? you know, um, um, not Hausdorff, <laughs> what a totally disconnected um, compact space, not Hausdorff. <laughs> so, but so the profinite is very strange. It's like, what is that? If you have profinitely many copies of something, what is that actual space? So if you have this double emergence and it's very kind of fractal-like, um, I'm really interested in that. So again, maybe the strong coupling has to do with irreversibility and reconstructability. I'm very, very interested in what we mean by, you know, something is irreversible. 
right? I think we need to go into that just a little bit more. Um, and, and is there a play between irreversibility and reconstructability, right? The descent condition says you can reconstruct this higher space from this level space. What does it mean that you, if you like fail to reconstruct? So we say, is a diamond X like reconstructable up to irreversibility? You've seen the up to condition in, in mathematics, which is like A is sort of equal to B up to some condition, meaning con considering that condition. So the hope is that yes. So if I can get this play between reconstructability and irreversibility, maybe that'll make more sense mathematically for what it means to be irreversible. So coupling, the strength of the coupling would be in the levels of the profiniteness and the non-locality. How many levels do you actually have there? What's the strength? So coupling by perturbation, I already said that's perfectoid and tilting. So big questions, what would actually non-locality be in active reference? I wanna leave these rhetorically because I wanna get to this, um, um, that pretty image, Daniel, before we wait for pause to the next question. So, and I think it's like coming up. Yeah, it's right there. Okay. So what is non-locality in active inference? What is holography in active inference, right? Which is this very awesome dimensional phenomena where uh, there's a strong interaction in, you know, say dimension N, and then maybe there's like a weaker interaction in N minus one. What does that mean? And that if one space is too difficult, you go to the other space. What does that actually mean? And they're actually related, sort of like a hologram. So a hologram is this 2D kind of scrambled image that maybe you bounce light on and you get this 3D phenomena. So in one sense, the 3D is redundant because you already had it in 2D. So what is the notion of redundancy in active inference? That's what I'm interested in. So what is a diamond equivalent of profinite in active inference? Where's the fractalness that's sort of happening, right? The fractal multiplicity. What is object persistence in active inference? That's tricky. Right. So, um, you know, when we, you know, we say, you know, the observer measures the electron and things like this, um, you know, the pair of, uh, of entangled photons, you know, acts non-locally or something like this. What does that actually mean? Why is it the same photon? And so uh, Chris Fields and I are trying to work on this awesome idea of object persistence of what that actually is. Right. I mean, you saw me a couple of weeks ago. Right. But is it the same Shanna? How does that work? How does objects persistence work? when you're going through like a multiple time, you know? What is emergent time in active inference? Where is it more likely? Where in embodied uh, um, like cognition is emergence? So what is pro-emergence there? So I want you to think about these as we're kind of going through. What is a singularity, right? In active inference, like a singular event. <clears throat> what is coupling, right? What is the actual coupling? What does the strength of an interaction mean? So if you want to play for shared action amid global uncertainty, Maybe we should work in discrete time, operate in grand unified theories, master this local global localization by these higher order awarenesses. Machine learning, right? Operate in grand unified theories. Let's go higher, right? Let's not work in networks anymore. Let's work in three morphisms. Medical, okay, let's model the brain as a hologram. Maybe these thoughts or these certain chromatic towers, I talked about the, the uh, chromatic homotopy theory last time. It has this beautiful uh, notion um, of um, equating spectra, you have this notion of uh, this theorem called chromatic convergence theorem that says that you can, reconst uh, you can reconstruct a certain object from its towers of spectra. So you have a boost field localization, which, lo which is sort of like um, the idea of my to the topological localization I referred to, which is a way of sort of connecting spaces. And um, again, if, if, you know, you know, if in certain neurological maybe degeneration, maybe the actual morphisms are cut. You know, you can think about things like that. Uh, you're no longer able to recall because maybe all the maps are gone, right? So maybe that you could more aptly model things like interrogate amnesia and neurodegeneration. So medical level and uh, Levin and Fields have this awesome um, um, kind of new workout about entanglement across daughter cells. What is holography in daughter cells? At least it's, you know, at least we can measure entanglement in something besides photons, you know? So you need this particularity. Um, is temporal non-locality, is it like instantiation without reciprocitous advent, right? This is me going like wild here. So advent means that you've arrived, but in, but in body cognition, if the environment has arrived, I've arrived, this is double play, right? So is it an instantaneousness without a sort of two-way interaction, what does that actually mean? What does temporal non-locality mean? I don't really know. Can we actually construct, for instance, a profinite version of that, which is again, this kind of super disconnected fractal space? Is temporal non-locality dialetheism time? Everyone knows I'm a super fan of dialetheism. This is a construction of logic. 
where you can have both A and not A at the same time. Normally you cannot, right? You have a, you know, a, you know, A or B, A there, you know, not A, therefore B. Why can't A and not A obtain at the same time? So you get this beautiful construction called dialetheism. We may start messing around in that. So it is, does a diamond construction of temporal non-locality fail time as it fails all pro-incarnations of duration? So you can get a lot of interesting heavy questions with this. If so, what are the actual conditions for object persistence in a non-locality that is pro-finite? How do you actually do that, right? How does something persist um, in those conditions? How does persistence work in a singular case, such as anterograde amnesia? You know, I spoke of uh, Clive Waring last time, um, you know, uh, was a beautiful pianist. Um, he's still living, which is great, but he got an anterograde amnesia and has no more personal memory, but has a motor memory. And so there's, um, you know, some, some difficulties there, but it's very interesting how the memory levels work. So the question is multiply profound, so at least try to hold on to it, you know, with a small assessment. Maybe this has to do with, like, with thoughts and memory like, recollection. We can go into that. But can first I, a dream. Oh, go ahead. Can I just make a few active inference points yes, there? Yes, do it. Okay. So I'm uh, recalling my thoughts here by looking at the paper, which I took notes mm -hmm. on. Um, first, you mentioned the dynamic persistence and a multi-scale persistence. And that reminded me of the ship of Theseus, which is like if you replace all the planks of the ship, is it the same ship? So it's a philosophy-styled question. <laughs> And then we're approaching it in a formal way. And then uh -huh. it comes very close to active inference when you had the slide, a needed particularity. That reminded me of Carl Friston's recent paper, which was called A Free Energy Principle for a Particular Physics. And particular is a pun because it means specific, but also it means particle. And so when we say a particle or a point, it's like that is the unit of analysis that we can pick up, we can make edges between points, and we can engage in a higher level of network mapping. So when we're thinking about particles here, and this way that particles can be related in nested uh, models or nested categories, I'm not sure what technical word would be, we're, we're kind of talking about a particular approach. Oh, I love this. Yes, just trying yes. to like, give a little little active inference, you know, throw out some red meat. No, please. No. <laughs> yeah, every 10 slides, every five, stop me. <laughs> no, yes, I, I think, cool. uh, wow, how neat. You see, and that's like an incarnation. It's like, this, 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 is, uh, this is exciting. Yeah, what a play. That's perfect. I'm curious to see what you think about the next couple slides. Um, okay, I say, but first, right, so you have all this mathy stuff. We're going to do this, we're going to do this, you know. Uh, like Daniel said, we're probably doing Friston stuff, pulling at everybody's stuff. Ship of Theseus. But first a dream, because I want to get like a little pretty. So we are interested in the relation between diamond descent, the stop mechanism. So I know uh, Fields and Levin and everyone has been like baffled by that. Uh, the stop mechanism that, you know, doesn't work in something like cancer cells. Yeah. When, when do things stop? I'm actually very curious about that. Um, and the storage and reflection uh, and recollection of profinely many copies of information in the form of mathematically impure geometric points, right? If you're modeling, um, you know, neurons as diamonds, what is, whoa, uh, okay, you have covers of diamonds, like I said, um, you know, the, if the proprioception is topological and in the covers, then maybe you could actually model neurons as these diamond phenomena. So um, someone like Clive Waring has all the diamonds, but the, the covers are cut. So it's almost like you cannot access that, right? Very interesting when the actual, you know, uh, balloons are cut, you cannot get the balloon anymore <laughs> if they're attached to you. So we posited a model of the brain that's actually allowing for various mathematical partitions in the brain in the form of uh, profinite many copies of the diamond, right? So the neurons are geometric points, which are morphisms of schemes, like I said, then maybe anterograde amnesia would resemble some kind of sustained truncation of diamond descent. Why are those maps continually, continuously cut? Which is why I'm very interested in this object persistence. So considering temporal non cality can we model thoughts as pro-finite reflections of pro topological covers? Oriented in non-locality, right? Someone from your, um, from your community also was asking me about thoughts, and I was like, that's such a great question. What, you know, clearly there's some, like, there's an EM field going on, but it's something more than that. And then the brain seems to operate like a hologram as well. So what is that, right? Are these actual, the profinite reflections, you know, like if you cannot organize your thoughts or things bouncing all over the place, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that are internal or the, you know, is the, the diamond super internally reflected at that point? 
So this may help, I said, you know, to model the state of being fully conscious, right, during dreamless sleep. No one has that. <laughs> uh, fully conscious during the dreamless sleep, what would that actually be? Um, which perhaps takes the form of sleeping in a diamond hourglass. So, um, you know, I write like kind of fantastical mathematical fiction books, and this is my second one uh, that I'm working on about, you know, sleeping in a diamond hourglass. What does that actually mean? So you're working in diamond time at that point. What does that mean? Profinitely many reflections of time, which probably takes some kind of image like this, right? So I always have unicorns over because I'm like, oh, it's magic, right? And what does it actually mean to sleep inside of anything hourglass. I'm very, very curious because, you know, when we go to sleep, nothing is really asleep. Your system is still functioning, right? But, quote, where do you go? And I'm not sure what, you know, I'm going to put that out there to the, your community. What is that, right? Why can you not be fully conscious during dreamless sleep? Not the little brief periodics, right? Of, uh, of dream sleep that you get, but where is that? So it'd be something like sleeping in an hourglass, which is actually very strange. And you think, oh God, what if somebody takes the hourglass and turns it upside down and shakes it, <laughs> you know? Um, but this would almost be an hourglass without cardinality. So there is no up or down here, you know? And so um, stay tuned, that book is coming out soon. Okay, <laughs> which is cool. But it's all, it's nested in, in the profinite condition. If you're gonna say object persistence, that happens when you sleep as well. So to get to some of the mathy stuff, there's some main conjectures. I'll talk about the FMOF K theory of diamonds. Um, let's let's actually look at that diamond shape again. Um, and let's get into the diamond holographic principle, the Farg Fontaine curve, why we're using a tail cohomology, and let's go to emergent time, you know, or as far as many of these as we can. So um, I may start skipping around, Daniel, in the interest of time, <laughs> you know, so that we can get to the good stuff. So I introduced this kind of wild um, con conjecture about, you know, this FMOF K theory of diamonds in this localization sequence, which is a cofiber sequence. And uh, a modification of something called continuous K theory. So again, I told you earlier that maybe continuous K theory is the way to go if we're going to be modeling emergent time because you want to kind of stick together um, small pockets of, of, of local emergence. So this, uh, this number two uh, localization sequence is a cofiber sequence, and uh, you've got the, the K theory acting on D little sub-diamond and then K FMOF of the diamond Farc fontaine curve, uh, mapping to the FMOF uh, K theory of the non-diamond uh, Farg fontaine curve with a modification of this F continuous um, working in the, the category of sheaves. And this is actually um, this third um, left-hand side is actually going to be cor uh, corresponded to the actual, that, uh, that omega to the n is an actual uh, continuous K-theory spectrum of uh, D-diamond. So again, it's a way of actually gluing together and looking at the like isomorphism classes of what's happening in these diamonds. So again, my idea is this, you have these profinitely many copies uh, that of, of uh, the actual geometric impurities. So you already have those, and we actually want to figure out what's happening between those. So like, what's a two morphism between the profinite copies? That's what my interpretation of the K theory is going to be. So you have this level, let's go up a higher level. K theory is actually looking at what makes things like unified at that higher level. So it's cool. So this D um, upper diamond is a stable, dualizable, presentable uh, infinity one category of diamonds. D sub diamond is actually the complex of V stacks of locally spatial diamonds where a complex is a um, sort of like a collection. And then you have the actual relative Farg Fontaine curve and the diamond. So I don't want to talk about that too, too much. Let's get to the actual diamond holography principle. But the diamond holography principle should fall out and be immediate from this localization sequence. So once again, our diamond holographic principle is going to use these two adjoint pairs where these uh, you have a direct image and inverse image functor and then an exceptional um, uh, and, and, and inverse um, exceptional functor, which is this uh, F lower shriek and F upper shriek. That's the kind of cool way of saying exclamation point. <clears throat> What's the main point is that, um, again, we want to take these double adjoint pairs and make a two infomorphism out of them. So these are from Schultz's six operations, a tail cohomology of diamonds. Um, we we'll actually want to condensify this. So how do you rephrase all this in terms of a sheaf of sets like on a certain site? I'm going to go into what that means. And then a sort of, uh, you know, how do, how do we think about holography in terms of a mathematically, um, mathematical impurity geometric point, the SPA CD, that's the attic spectrum of this uh, closed um, algebraic curve mapping to the actual diamond. 
So again, try to think of, a, you know, when we think about reflections, we're trying to mathematically interpret that. So then let's actually discuss emergent time from that condensed setting and investigate a condensed version of the actual uh, continuous K theory for pro-emergence, right? That's wild. So the continuous K theory, right? So let's use FML continuous K theory and then actually try to put the pro object together as a pro-emergence. Boom. Um, okay, so here's this um, image. I think I showed it last time. So the one of the main goals is to actually have an infinity one categorification of geometric Langlands. The Langlands program is so beautiful. What is it trying to do? It's, um, you know, it's a mathematical interpretation of shared action. You are working across very difficult, disparate fields um, with lots of uncertainty. <laughs> and um, uh, so you have these beautiful phenomena called Langlands reciprocity, Langlands functoriality, where you actually, you know, uh, you're creating a certain situation in which, um, you know, certain representations of objects are actually automorphic forms. And so different incarnations are being shown to be the same thing, which is like a, a, a version of the same thing, which is cool. So in this um, model that I have here, so the diamonds in the middle, and again, you have the Efimov K theory of the actual diamond curve. And at the bottom, you know, I said, oh, this structure is, you know, possibly an infinity one topoid which goes back to Daniel's point about bringing all the structure in. So uh, an infinity one topoi is an infinity one category. It satisfies a descent condition. It's locally Cartesian closed, so everything maps to each other. It's got a kappa filter on it. So everything is nice and contained, um, which is really nice. All right, and so you can also, uh, these LNs can also be interpreted in terms of, uh, I have a little note there about a Lubin Tate formal um, sheaf module. This is a law to link um, once again, one of these higher grain unified theories, you can actually maybe link the geometrization of local Langlands with FMOF K theory. So I'm just putting some super mathy things because some people wanted some mathy things. All right. So um, that's Weinstein's work, which is really pretty. So let me actually formally define diamond. I don't think I did last time. Um, yeah. And then we get to the actual holography part. Okay. So let perf D be the category of perfectoid spaces. So again, these are attic spaces. They look like Huber spaces and um, they are fractal and strange, kind of like Berkovich spaces. So the, <clears throat> let perf D be that category, and perf be the subcategory of perfectoid spaces of characteristic P. Um, so no longer zero, P. So a diamond is a proatel sheaf. That's a sheaf in the proatel topology, which I told you is a very fine topology, which can be written as a quotient. Um, you know, X mod R. So it's of a pro you take the perfectoid space and you mod out and you glue by these proatel equivalence relations, boom, you get a diamond. What a beautiful way of doing that. So we say let C be an algebraically closed affinoid field. Um, it's a certain construction in the Huber sense. And then we say a geometric point. So this is the thing that I think would be beautiful to actually the thing. This is the actual object that could actually model neurons very nicely. Geometric point, the, which is the attic spectrum of that C mapping to the diamond, is made visible by pulling it back through a proatel cover X to D, resulting in profoundly many copies of spa C. So this is, again, huge relation with, uh, like, um, proprioception by topology, right? How do you actually visualize? How do you interpret? Things like this. So a diamond is an actual algebraic space for that V-topology. And the V-topology, if anyone wants to know, is this actual cover, Fi, Xi, X, um, that consists of any maps, Xi to X, such that for any uh, quasi-compact uh, open subset U and X, you have finite indices I, so that these, um, these open subsets jointly uh, cover U. So X there is an actual um, uh, V stack. Okay, so here's the diamond again, right? So um, we can think, what are these actual geometric points in terms of like embodied cognition, in terms of, you know, um, um, you know shared action, whatever you want to think. If, if I, you know, if I'm a diamond, Daniel's a diamond, how do you actually relate those two diamonds by these like big maps? And so you can see that right here, you have this diamond. So um, the, the actual footnote, is um, calling it what it is. So you take the p-addicts, right, which is the field of p-addicts, QP. We can, if we want to find the diamond spectrum of that, which is that spod D, so the diamond spectrum that's akin to the actual prime spectrum, the attic spectrum I showed you. So you can actually only ever get the attic spectrum of QP cyclotomic, which, which is the cyclotomic field of the p-addicts. You don't actually get all the p-addicts. So this, uh, modded out by this ZP cross, which is a Galois action, um, it's it's um, underlined because it's profinite. So how interesting that you never actually get, you want the left-hand side, spotty QP, but you only get profinitely many copies of the cyclotomic. So you never actually get what you're after 
And this is actually has a lot of phenomenology behind it uh, because like, again, Robert and I are really, and Chris and I are really fascinated by the phenomenology of what is. So if we actually have, you know, um, if you want to think interface or if you want to think whatever it is in our organism, are we actually ever truly interacting with the thing or just our representation of the thing? Um, you know, you've got me at the level going, well, you know, uh, if interaction is just me interacting with a reflection of my environment, if it's actually me interacting with hidden states that were probably my reflections the whole time, um, what is it? Are we just sitting around with the finite many copies of the thing and we never actually get the thing? Any questions for, for um, I feel like that's a lot of math. <laughs> yeah. yep, a lot of math and pretty a, pictures. Yeah. There's a question in the chat. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yep, uh, CB writes, according to this fascinating framework and from an awareness perspective, is the dark room problem still considered as a problem? Grateful for any elaboration on that, and thanks to the speaker. So, the dark room problem being um, the philosophical thought experiment where what does an agent in a dark room do? And in the free energy world, some people initially, several years ago, brought that up as something like a critique. They'd say, well, aren't you very precisely sure that you're in a dark room? So, if active inference is about reducing uncertainty, then isn't that the perfect state? But of course, the pragmatic answer is that while you're in that dark room, your uncertainty about the world is increasing. So I'm wondering if that maps on to a multi-level uncertainty concept, because it's almost like you're getting precise at the visual level that you're in a dark room, but you're getting increasingly imprecise at not just a different lateral level, like you're getting imprecise on smell while you're getting precise on vision, but actually at a higher level, you're getting imprecise on visually what's outside. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, keep going. What do you think? What a beautiful question. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. Uh, More questions and less me talking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I, I'm uh, thinking of it as there's three roads meeting in some ways here. There's philosophy, mm -hmm. you know, we've brought up the mm -hmm. dark room, the ship of Theseus. Then yes. there's a lot of the formal mathematics, which certainly mm -hmm. I'm scribbling down, but are um, just beginning to learn. And then there's mm -hmm. the active inference community who might be oh. familiar with this idea of multi-level uncertainty, Ooh. but not have connected it to, for example, philosophy or math. So we got people coming and going <laughs> on like all this. those roads. No, this is beautiful. So it's like, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's not take one single dark room. Let's expand it. If every organism had their own dark room, yeah. Um, Let's like let's take that question and accelerate it a little bit. Would a dark room survive in a two infomorphism, right? Let's go a little. Let's let's say um, you know on an information perspective, is it dark? Probably not. It's just on the organism perspective, right? So that's a actually the dark room is a very beautiful um, I think instantiation of what I'm actually saying here with the diamond. So in the dark room, you may just have profile many copies of the dark, but as Daniel's saying, like all your other senses are being very like perfectoided. I'm just playing. They, they, you know, other senses are being uh, more fine tuned at the expense of something else. So my question is this: It's like why don't why can't we increase the sort of bandwidth to be able to be precise everywhere? Like why is it dark to the extent of something else, right? Um, and how do we actually do that? That's that's very interesting. Um, I think it, I think dark room is still a problem. Has anybody solved that? It's still a problem, right? I guess a problem for a philosopher, but not yeah. a problem for the human in the dark room. And right. let me ask one one question on the operations on diamonds. Yes, people might be familiar with the operations on numbers like addition, mm -hmm. subtraction, multiplying, dividing. Right. So is it mm -hmm. fair to say that the operations that you're going to be describing, they're like ways to work with diamonds just like plus and minus are ways to work with numbers oh that's a, yeah okay it's a very good um very good question so you know we can answer that very abstractly that there really is no intrinsic definition of a number you can say uh the number five well what is it five times one you know six uh you know six minus one you have so many ways of going going at it that a number is actually just an equivalence class right so if a number is just an equivalence class then then you can think of the same thing as a diamond. Diamond is still equivalence class, right? A certain equivalence class between, um, but you're in a different a different structure. So sheaves, you sheaves don't really add like one plus one. 
So there's a little more, now you can, is there an algebra of sheaves? Oh, absolutely. And the beauty is that, so if sheaves are this like um, way of keeping track of local data, like a little bag that's associated to every space, there are ways of gluing those together. You don't really add them, but you can glue them and start gluing them and start gluing them and start gluing them. So in a sense, they are number theoretic because if you're defining a number as an equivalence relation. So you can think, yeah, one plus one like equals two, whatever that means. Or you can say gluing and then gluing and then gluing and then gluing. So you can actually get an infinity category of these sheaves. So I recommend anyone looking at like, um, you wanna learn like some of the, the best global mathematics and like learning it uh, conceptually first is to look at the sheaf interpretation. And you're like, wait, was addition a sheaf the whole time? You know? <laughs> Talk about dark room and mathematics. I'm just funny. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, so operations, so, and, and so, um, you know, bless Peter for being so amazing in coming up with this idea. It's like, oh, not only can you put a sheaf on a topological space, you can put a sheaf on a category. That's the sort of interesting thing that I'm into. So take your idea of operating, of like adding numbers, and just go to the category of numbers. And then if you start working categorically, that's already shared action. You're in this like higher space. Um, yeah, so operations with diamonds on diamonds, showing something is a diamond, okay, it's all just a little rigorous, but at the end, it gives you such an, a, an aestheticism because um, I think that you know all of this work should be pulling in everyone. You need the philosophers, make sure we're asking the right question. You need the you know crazy math people like me to come up with like <laughs> well I don't know let's try like an infinity category and then you need um, you know you need active like we need people actually uh, you know working on how do you relate all this so you need active inference you need the philosophy and you need to put everyone together yeah so in the dark room my question is it's it's like um, you know at what point was dark like light you know so I think also the darkness is like maybe a pro finite condition the question is if we sat in the dark room forever would it eventually become light you know, and then you bring in time. So dark room is really interesting and try to think of dark room in a temporal non-locality. That's how I would take that problem and kind of accelerate it just a little bit. Dark room in terms of a diamond, dark room inter change the time interpretation, like in all these uh, models, you know, time is always uh, modeled as a total order. That's another thing I would like to hear from your community. Like, um, you know, total order, has this like connexity property that every two objects in the total order are, are comparable. Why? Why do we model time as continuous? Why do you model time as a total order? Um, hmm. I think that I think that should be changed just a little bit and move it like non-Archimedean. Quantum mechanics is going to work non-Archimedean with a very specific cutoff, right? The Planck length. Then I think you should also be working with non-Archimedean time. So um, the awesome person who asked the uh, question about the dark room. Please try to think about dark room, like in in some kind of temporal non locality. If time was everywhere, I'm really interested in that. <clears throat> Ooh, I make awesome. one more one more comment here. Please, is yeah. Quite early, you mentioned how a stack. You said it's it it takes in categories, not for example mm -hmm. sets. And connecting that to what you said about operations, this might be quite familiar to a computer scientist for whom oh. the function can take in different things. So we know there's functions that take in numbers, like two plus two, but then there might be a function that takes in a large data set that has a diamond description. And so computer science and engineering, kind of the application, it's really easy sometimes to apply these recursive definitions, recursion central to computer science, but you're right, when you go to the infinite level, that's kind of where the theory builds beyond any real implementation of a computer program so we're on the mm -hmm. bottom looking up with the computer science implementations of nested mm -hmm. networks and then mm -hmm. here's the hand coming from the top down saying there's a way to you know infinitely structure that and throw a sheath on it or i don't know oh see that's what i'm saying yeah it's like to upgrade a machine learning it's another project i'm working on it's like categorify it you know what i mean like um, when, you know, the specific definition of stack is a two sheaf, right? So it's a sheaf that takes values in categories. That's actually, and so it's like, yeah, if you move from, you know, like an output is a weighted function or something. If you move from that to the category of all possible weighted functions, then, you know, your complexity has just grown probably like threefold. 
You see? Yeah, the output no longer needs to be something singular. I outputted a weighted function, you know, particular to this distribution. Why? Why here, don't you output an actual category? Yeah. Here's a, another great question from the chat from Stephen. Mm -hmm. He wrote, if these category theory and geometry approaches enable another multi-scale formalism that treats time differently, can this approach play nicely with current multi-scale active inference formalisms? Sounds like he summarized our conversation. <laughs> Steven should present. <laughs> yeah, can he tell me a little bit more about the multi-scale active inference? See, he, you're right on it. If you stackify things, right? Think of it like this. Think that, um, you know, like uh, Daniel was saying, if every, you know, if every like, think of every network being like a point in the moduli space, do you see? Then that whole thing is just a point. And then how do you actually get from point to point? So is that the sort of like multi-scale, multi-class? I'm super into like multi-class classification, you know? I really like this question. Yes, switch it up to like pro-finite. If you categorify the thing, you're gonna get more connections, right? Then you're just, then you're working in like categories of multi-class active inference, not just one. Why don't we split it up? Why don't you color it, call them incarnations and relate them if it's a powerful enough category you can put a sheaf on it, put a sheaf on it, and then start gluing them all together. And then I think you really have a multi-class shared inference. Hmm. Does that make sense, Stephen? Wow, what a great question. Do you have any thoughts on that, on the multi-class? I mean, I think that's what, you know, we're saying. <laughs> One thought and the way that we've been talking about multi-scale active inference is like, let's say the brain is the internal state and then the body is external to it. So then you have the blood brain barrier. And then at the next level out, you have the brain and the body interacting with the social niche and then you can go up and you can have societies or groups that are interacting with each other and it's a debate in active inference does the group really have a blanket or what kind of blanket does it have and right, right. here we're not going to speak directly to that but we can think of quote american society as a point it's a point mm -hmm. and then it has internal structure but by using that basically linguistic token by saying it mm -hmm. is a point, it's literally one term that you can pass, then mm -hmm. it uh, abstracts over lower levels. And I'm not exactly sure on um, what is strong enough to have a sheath or not, or what that mm -hmm. enables, but it sounds like mm -hmm. it's making these nested structures and uh, mm -hmm. laterally interacting structures, making them composable and mm -hmm. kind of compilable so that we can tractably zoom in and zoom out or work with guarantees or proofs on these types of structures. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And so I encourage everyone to uh, maybe as a challenge and Stephen will like this too. When we say like, okay, so thank you for explaining that for the multi-class. Yeah, I agree. Super, like all these levels. Yeah. To reinterpret that because it's always a boundary condition, right? Blood brain barrier, barrier between me and group, barrier between like uh, collectivity and non-collectivity, things like this, right? Um, what is a group, group action and things like this. So reinterpret that with a notion of a pro-finite boundary. I'm very curious as to what these boundaries are, right? They're not solid. They seem to be sort of like, uh, are they hidden? So the very concept of a boundary is a hidden state is something that I was playing with. And I was like, you know what? At what point is the boundary there? Does that make sense? It's almost like, um, you know, boundary and hidden state is like this darkroom phenomenon that all of a sudden somebody turns on a light, boom, boundary is there, right? So when you have mm -hmm. Levin and Fields talking about like entanglement, like, uh, you know, across uh, boundaries and things like this, like, or maybe the only way to decohere is on the boundary, where is the information? And that's actually a really important question. But if you can reframe all of that, try to reframe the multi-class, like, uh, you know, or the multi-scale um, active inference in terms of a boundary that's like a fractal. That's very strange. You see what I mean, Daniel? Right? Then it's like, then there's no clear defined boundary. Um, I'm sure there's, if there's a lot of people listening, like anyone kind of super empath or if you have empath friends, I mean, I swear, like some, I can just be walking and like, you know, the tree goes into me or something like that. So I don't have very good boundaries like that, right? My mind thinks about everything. <laughs> And it swaps, you know, like I wish there was like a Jedi school, you know, I mean, I would totally be there. I'm like, how do I do this? <laughs> um, and I think the active inference people like are the Jedi school. It's like, okay, let's figure this out. So if you do multi-scale any of this, 
play with that notion of a boundary. You know, just like you saw, I'm very, you know, math people can almost get kind of, you know, too much with it, but you want to be precise about every word. <clears throat> and we're real careful when we define things like moduli space, like what a family of bundles means, what a family of isomorphism classes mean. Um, so really think about what you're defining as boundary. And if that boundary was not solid, because they never are, if you have a profinite boundary, it just changes a little thing. It changes the way in which that scale is sort of hierarchized, I think. Yeah. Do you have it, multiple levels of inference going on? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I can give a, a physical metaphor to Please. what you said about these multi-scale. Yes. <laughs> so let's just say yeah. that you are looking at a textbook for anatomy and it would say, what is the boundary of the lungs? What is the blanket around the lungs? Well, at that level, the gross anatomy level, it's the peripleura. It's the, the membrane that just encloses it like one bag. And you can even have a point, just the lungs. But then if you really zoom in, it's actually truly a fractal with the alveoli. And the way that actually mm -hmm. the boundary of the lung, it probably looks like a piece of broccoli because Ooh. Are you looking at it from the outside with just a single sack or will you go into finer scale and see that the interface has a fractal dimension oh see and that's what i'm saying right like you know at what point was the room dark was it always dark and we just didn't notice it that's what i'm talking about and will the room always be dark i don't think so right i think at some point if you were in the dark room it would change and so just like what Daniel's saying, you zoom in on this stuff and you know there's more space between the like atoms if you actually want to use that approach, right? What is that? And that's what I'm really interested in. So you have all these different smears. It could be happening that like if all of these events actually happen and they are just temporally extended, what does that actually mean? It's almost like a time sheaf. You know what I mean? If interaction is like this, what, time spread? No idea. No idea. These are... I think these these interrogatories should direct all of the work. And that's why all my math is like super philosoph like philo philosophically. I don't know. I did say elephants earlier. Now I just said philosophically. <laughs> so it's like, uh, okay, I'm just getting excited. This is awesome. So, um, if I could just that? say yeah, yeah. one more on the philosophy um, point. Please. The dark, the dark room problem. So yeah. you just rephrase the dark room problem as being like, you know, was it room always dark? It's almost like, well, if there's no person in the room, what's the mm -hmm. problem? Or it, it's it's thinking about the person's, the time that they're in that room, because you're not right. appealing to an alternate universe where somebody has always been and always will be in a dark room. You're appealing mm -hmm. to our everyday experience of being in a dark mm -hmm. room. But that is only part of our regular behavioral sequences. So mm -hmm. not exactly sure where that would uh, take the, the uh, dark room investigation, but it, it mm -hmm. helps us see that it's part of a bigger set of experiences mm -hmm. or of, uh, of scenarios that the agent is experiencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my question is like, if this boundary is like pro finite and fractal, what's, what's to prevent us going from dark room and then maybe a white room, right? Dark room, white room, dark room, white room, dark room, white room. Right. Or let me ask if anyone knows what would be the actual um, antipodal reference of a dark room? Is there an actual opposite of a dark room? Would that be like, what would that be? <clears throat> if it were, I'm interested um, in that. If it were a stochastic signal mm -hmm. coming into your eyes, so just like a white noise, then mm -hmm. it would almost be like a dark room of a different kind because sure there'd be yes. light coming on your retina, but informationally right. you're still not getting anything. So at the higher right. level, it's a similar problem, but it it uncouples it from the photons hitting your retina, which actually doesn't matter. Right. Yeah, and I think there was something I was reading, um, um, oh, I forgot what it was, uh, about like synesthetes and how synesthetes store information, because I have sort of half of that. Um, but I was like, maybe I should find out a little about myself. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, they, there was some wild study that was like, if you put pure white light on the retina, I would love for your community to investigate this, like you actually can't see. It actually negates object vision. Pure white light, so unspectrated, mm. on the retina will actually negate object vision. Now, again, I saw this. Uh, it was in a philo uh, philosophy work, which I, you know, I trust the, you know, again, I'm I'm not like a super scientist about that, but that's really interesting, right? So just like Daniel said, in a pure white room, you'd also be in the dark. 
So that's, that's interesting. And so you see, you need this like messy, so pure white light, you know, would hurt us. <laughs> you cannot see object vision. So it makes me think is object vision uh, itself profinite, right? If it seems to be emergent, if it seems to be falling out, if you cannot see the actual, when pure white light, if it's a non-spectra is interacting with our system, we cannot take it. What are the actual implications of that? And can you actually scale that, right? So that's why I was saying with the dark it, and, and with emergence, like, at what point it is emergent? At what point of like, you know, photonic light hitting your eyes, um, must it be non-white, like pure, you know? So that's actually interesting that the actual purest conditions of something may, may negate the, uh, the organism's object functionality, right? And then we're actually hurting. So at that point, you may have to rely on the higher two morphisms, and then you go join the Shanna Daniel Jedi School. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm just like, all right. So uh, um, maybe I should talk just a little bit more about the time stuff, and then um, leave with like another fun drawing. Um, this is an cool. awesome conversation. Um, okay, so again, we all know that time is a problem. Why is it emergent? Why am I talking about emergent time? When when we can go so far with these ideas, it's good to bring in an example, like Daniel was saying about you know alveoli and things like that. Um, the actual, um, I take care of a lot of elderly <clears throat> family members. And so I, my earliest memories are hospitals and that might be why I kind of grow, grew up so quick, um, just with all these like heavy questions. And I remember, um, you know, we were having a lot of problems with like the actual oxygen CO2 exchange, right? That's actually really tricky. So it's, it's not like if someone, you know, is, uh, suffering, you know, in the, like the pulmonary sense, you can't just, you know, and put an oxygen mask on and it's fine. So the actual body's way of absorbing that, I think is very, very, very tricky. The CO2, um, you know, exchanging with the O2 in this fractal web of broccoli, you know? So what is that? And that's happening 24 seven as I like giggle and give this talk. It's like my alveoli are excited. I think I just said alveoli, like ravioli. My ravioli are excited. All right, anyway, I don't know what I'm saying. All right, so, um, <laughs> but it's nice to, when you have all this high math to try to rein it in with something biological. So people are like, Shanna, why are you talking about biology? I'm like, cause I wanna try to find something here that we can use to sort of justify temporal non-locality non besides entangled photon pairs. Everybody uses entangled photon pairs. Why don't we use, like Daniel was saying, like the actual system? Why don't we use the organism to test on? Um, so again, if, if there's actual entanglement going on in the daughter cells, I am excited about that and want to think, uh, want to ask the community what we think about uh, entanglement, which is again going to mess with this idea of time, right? Time and boundaries. So we know that there's a problem of time. Um, you're like, you know, your heavyweights in quantum mechanics have the Wheeler DeWitt equation says the universe is static to an external observer. I'm gonna have some questions with like the external versus the internal observer. I don't really know what that is because again, I think all boundaries are pro-finite. So it's a little tricky. Um, quantum mechanics is you know gonna say that time is universal and absolute. General relativity is gonna say that it's actually malleable and relative, right? And then, you know, people like me, the category the theory people, maybe time is like a morphism, you know? So I always, you know, I ask back to the darkroom question and things like this, even your local time, was it like, what is time? Was it always here? Where is non-Archimedean time? So if we're thinking about like hidden states, right? And any kind of embodied cognition, it's very interesting how your memory, it's not very solid. What people, maybe people's earliest memory is like when they're six, my one friend, he's like, uh, I don't know, like 12. I'm like, you don't remember anything until you're 12? <laughs> like, what is that? So when does your little system actually come online? Is this once again a play between irreversibility and reconstructability? Is it also a play between your multi-scale own active inference? Have you stopped? Is it possible that you were only in your own reflections until age seven? And then you were able to actually reach your reflections, right? Is this Maybe like people's earliest memory? Talking about. So if you're thinking about like I am, that interaction and perception and all these things that are feedback loops with your own system, right? Anything that's feed, feeding back into the actual kind of non-local organism for cognition, it's reflection based. So, but if you were only in reflection land, maybe your memory would never come online. So where is it? Like, where is time? Was it always here? Where's yesterday? Like, I, I just don't know. <laughs> you know? Um, so we say these, like, you know, we have these existential qualifiers, like there exists, right? 
but what are the conditions for all of this? It's, you know, we're here for such a short time and there's all these big questions, right? I want to know what an emergent time asymmetry is. It's very interesting when I ask, you know, why do we seem to go forward or something? You, you're almost, you're dealt with another answer that's super fuzzy and only defined in the negative, right? Uh, there seems to be like a time asymmetry. I'm like, did you just use time to define time? Like, isn't that, we can't do that, right? Um, I mean, I guess we can, but what would actually be an emergent time asymmetry? At what point, if you think about that pro construction I was talking about, how do you actually get a time asymmetry in that crazy environment? right? Or just like, um, you know, the beautiful darkroom example, um, or even Stephen's example, the question, right? How do you actually get asymmetries on this emergent scale? Go even weirder with what I said. How do you get asymmetries in this doubly emergent scale? Can you actually get an asymmetry in just one of the morphisms? I don't know. These questions are once again huge. How would you actually have the notion of an entropy, right, in an embodied um, cognition where you're, you know, exchanging with the environment, if time was discrete, this is what I want to think about. So just like Daniel gave us the great example, on the outside, we're all so beautiful. We wear these like awesome clothes and we have these, you know, beautiful features. And then if you actually zoom in like to the actual lung sacs, right? Very tricky fractal stuff going on there. Why don't we look at time the same way? Out here, you have this, you know, like supposed continuum, which I don't really like uh, believe in. What if you zoomed in? How would you actually figure, if time was actually discrete, like a set of points like that moduli space, is there a dark room in between each time? And that's why I'm really interested in this dark room. Who's to say that you're not blinking in and out of it like every plank second, you know? That's what I'm really interested in, is that, you know, your eye seems to be doing an interpolation anyway, right? They've done those studies about like eye tracking. And when you're actually looking at someone, it's just like eyes and mouth or something like this. You don't really look at the ear. <laughs> so it's actually, you're putting together an image of me based on your tracking. Yeah. And so you're actually doing an interpolation like 24 uh, seven, even go down to like the cesium atom, like time. <laughs> so are you not doing the same thing for time itself? That's where I'm really, that's what I'm interested in. Take the time, zoom in. If time is also this boundary, this fractal curve, um, you know, uh, my awesome mentor, uh, beautiful, amazing wizard mentor, Dr. Lapidus, Michelle Lapidus, you know, came up with like, you know, fractal curves and fractal cohomology and all this stuff. That's really interesting, right? Fractal zeta functions. Um, what if time is something like that? So what is structural causality? You've got Bertrand Russell and these great wizards, right? Wittgenstein, language is a, you know, a game. And, um, you know, uh, you know, Bertrand Russell saying, you know, there's no there's no structural relation between uh, now and actually assuming that the world was created, you know, five minutes ago. So there's last Thursdayism, and then you get these fun things. All right. Once again, what is object persistence? How do you actually do that? Who's to say that the dark room is not flickering in and out like every, you know, second? Um, once again, the stop mechanism. Really interested in what your community thinks about that, right? So again, uh, in something like you know, horribly sad, like the proliferation of cancer cells or something. Why, how does that act so locally, right? You could just have that in a particular area and it starts like spreading through like, you know, metastasis and stuff like that, but it originates locally. It doesn't originate as a systemic thing. And that's what I'm very interested in. Seems to be these pockets, right? Pockets of the stop mechanism failing can destroy the whole organism, which is back to that torsion thing I was talking about. You can have these few elements that annihilate, um, you know, uh, these torsion elements that are annihilated right, at the expense of the actual organism. So if we actually say, how does causality actually change per your, per your Turing degree? Remember, I sort of think that we can, you know, in your multi-scale active inference, it, it would be nice to classify organisms, maybe based on their problem solving um, capability. Um, so I really think there are no ontic boundaries. It seems to be these pro-finite boundaries. Then you're gonna ask ontic boundaries of what? Ontic boundaries of the organism, which you zoom in and find that it's like lung sac, like fractal broccoli, you know? And then, you know, just to keep going, why is space-time only a manifold? I showed you these other structures. What if we reinterpreted any of that GR stuff as like space-time being a diamond, you'd be allowing the multiplicity, which is the power of the organism, right? You are, it is not top down. You are learning from everything, right? So what would actually like a number theoretic time look like? Um, so let's go just a little bit deeper into emergence, right? Assuming it's emergent, what is an emergent from? What is the actual eschatology of time? That's what I'm really interested in. Like, is it going to be here? <laughs> what if it just left? You know, what if time just walked off and left, okay? Um, I'm really interested in planarium. So Chris Fields has taught me a lot about the planarium. 
So these are the the little worms that if you actually cut off a piece of them, again, I'm not into like animal cruelty, but if somehow a piece of them gets like removed, that little piece can regenerate the whole organism. And so Daniel was going to ask like, do y'all have any, any thoughts um, about that? Because it seems to be that the nervous system is acting non-locally. And it seems like, or the planarium, like, can they, is that like unemergence? Like, what is that? You know, so how can you actually have a piece reproduce the whole organism when we can't do that? So is there any thoughts about that? Like we lose a finger and it's very sad. We have a stop mechanism that actually prevents that. So I was going to just ask you all, since you're also complexity theorists, right? Do you also think that because our organism is more complex, we have a stronger mark of irreversibility, stronger cutoff of reconstructability, my, like if we all lost an arm, our arm is not reconstructable given our system, but it is for a planaria. So is there a play between complexity theory, hidden, do we have more hidden states than the actual planaria? Just wanted y'all's thoughts on that. Awesome question. I'm gonna address it with uh, an empirical observation rather than an appeal right. to theory. And just as you said, if we lose part of our body, we can't grow it back, but maybe you know, future technology could change that. But if you go right. to an ant colony and you scoop up the ants from a certain location, a few minutes later, other nestmates will have functionally replaced the nestmates that you had taken because they're all mm -hmm. diffusing around in the space. And so it's almost like the ant colony is more resilient to perturbation, including extreme mm -hmm. perturbations. However, mm -hmm. it has less morphological complexity in the interactions right. than, for example, a synapse. So it's like, yes. if you want to have, you know, the library with a lot of books, it's going to take a lot of space. If you want to have mm -hmm. a really precisely specified topology of interactions like neurons do, you're going to mm -hmm. have limited, not zero, but limited flexibility relative to a sort of distributed, totally fluidly mixing system like an ant colony. So there's definitely Ooh. something there with a, a trade-off on the complexity frontier of mm -hmm. how much resilience do you have and ability to regenerate or maybe mm -hmm. even to perpetuate indefinitely, like a, like a sponge or a coral or something like that, versus mm -hmm. irreversibly move towards order, which comes with the cost of uh, building tall buildings that can fall down. Right, right. And would we rather have like our sugar cubes as an ant colony or the tall building? I don't know, <laughs> right? Am I weird there? Would we be able to do both? <laughs> In awareness, we could be ants, you know, I'm just play. Um, yes. Wow, that's... <laughs> That's very remarkable. So that example is just as profound as these questions that I'm asking, right? There seems to be so many things happening at once and thinking about it in terms of perturbation, which again, I linked perturbation to the diamonds as well, right? You, so you can, you can still do that. And again, so that's an excellent question um, and um, it, with like a, a more excellent answer, right? Like how do you actually talk about emergence and also emergence and perturbation, right? Those go hand in hand but also emergence and irreversibility, and just like you said, uh, complexity. So thinking about complexity in terms of um, you know, emergence and also, uh, I like how you said resistance, but you know, with the advent of stuff like you know, epigenetics and things like that, I'm wondering, um, I don't know if you put planaria in a very horrible environment, if they still continue. It seems like ants kind of continue, right? They're like little fighters. Um, uh, yeah, and again, who's to say, I don't want to be speciest, who's to say that, you know, we are more complex than the ants because they have a collective phenomena, which is like super profound, right? Yeah. And so it's like, are we building tall, tall buildings to the extent of like not really connecting with each other, right? You need to think about stuff like that. Um, okay, so there's a question. Some... Yes, please. Okay, okay, it just... Uh... CB has returned with some funny and interesting questions. So there's two questions. There's a, a, a tiny one and then uh, a big one. The tiny All one, right, go for it. no pun intended, is can you elaborate on the idea of the infinitesimal thickening? So what does that mean? Oh, what yeah, is sure. the infinitesimal so, thickening? Yeah, sure. Say you had um, a space, right? I have a space or I have a pen. This is my pen. So we would actually say that the pin is carved out and it has a specific boundary, right? Um, outside of the pin, we would say is like a measure zero. There's nothing else outside of the pin. The pin stops and then you have like space, no pin. Do we all agree? There's a very strict boundary line between pin and no pin. So in infinitesimals, these are, these are um, in, they're, they're like um, collections of infinitely small 
um, pieces. They're not identically zero. They are, they still, they exist, but they're almost zero, but they're not quite zero. So surrounding the pin, we could say is an infinitesimal thickness, which is not all the way to zero, but there is like a little bit of wiggle. Does that make sense? So that's what we're saying, that there is a wiggle, a space around spaces. So just like I was saying, um, it, it gets, you know, it gets rid of notions like um, singular points. So we know there's, there was a lot of problems in, you know, uh, part the standard model is great, but in particle physics, there was problems with having points interact in these Feynman diagrams, remember everyone? And so you actually made the point, a one, a, a one dimensional object called a string to avoid the complications of just having a point. So in math, you can do the same way. Instead of having a singular condition, like this is my now, there's problems with that. What if you actually had a now that had a little infinitesimal, so surrounded by not almost zero. So think about the smallest numbers possible, but they go infinitely, right? So this is almost like um, if we know the, you know, the Archimedean property that there, you can always make a bigger number, you can always make a smaller number, always. So imagine that, that, that negative Archimedean all the way down. And so you, you surround a space with those, and then you don't have a singular space anymore. Thank you for the answer. And the second mm -hmm. question from Cambridge Breaths was, also, is it accurate to say that every experienced now can reflect innumerable other nows? If so, oh. is time travel possible? Oh, see, oh, I love your community, you know? <laughs> well, you know, I'm gonna say yes, cause I'm like the magic person here. Yeah, so again, what is a now? It, it's very interesting. You can have all the elaborate phys physics on the planet and then you ask, what is an observer? And the room goes quiet, right? So when we say, what is a now? That's what I'm saying. Like a now according to whom? We're all connected right now. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't say now. But at the same time, you're peripherally aware of everything going outside, like my animals, your next appointment, your digestive system, your autonomic nervous system. So when we say now, it's like now according to whom are you neglecting your own hidden states? And that's why I'm very curious as to what we mean by now. Also, um, I'm very, you know, I'm very adamant about saying, um, you know, there is no synchronous reference. Anyone who thinks this now is actually happening now, you've neglected the neuronal processes that are actually happening. There's neurotransmitter signals, you know, everything hap happening on neurological time to actually get you to have this now. So you're always in the past. Does that make sense? Right? You're always in the past, uh, but you're also not in the past. So you can get very like Alan Watts and Eckhart Tolle here and say, you really only have now. It is a hallucination to think that there is like a tomorrow. Because even when you actually remember the past, you're doing it now. We all agree you're always in this slice, right? But if you, there's a little bit more, um, do you see that if you do a formal spectra with the now, if you put a little bit of thickness on it, it allows for you to actually have a little bit of more room in the now, which is just like what um, you know, the question is asking. Can you, uh, you know, the now actually contains other nows. Yeah, because um, if the whole, if time is this pro-construction, which is what I'm trying to say, then you are linking together all kinds of things, right? Your thoughts happening now, where are they coming from? I don't know. And so is time travel possible? Oh yeah, you bet. That's what I said. That's why I was, <laughs> look at me, I'm all excited. You know, if you can actually partition the brain, okay, so let's get weird. I mean, not too weird. Don't do this to yourself, like, right? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> um, if you were actually to make the brain so that it was almost like a split screen, this is a very rough analogy. If you remember those, like, I don't know, older films that had like one panel going and the other one, I loved those just because, you know, I think like synesthete, hyperactive, I need to be like doing a lot, like multitask. So imagine you had that kind of split screen, but in your own awareness, in the awareness, not the now, but if we were actually able to split the system, then you would actually be able to quote time travel if time is non-local and if it was always there. All you really have to do is try to get to your like your your own V stack. And I think people are gonna be like, what is what is this girl talking about? But it's like if you could actually get to where you had those higher morphisms, then that would be very very exciting. And then time travel should be possible. When people time travel, it's like they normally. They normally like then the object themselves doesn't travel and they seem to think that you know perturbation doesn't exist so it's like if you're going to time travel you're going to be perturbing time be ready for time to perturb you back i'm not saying it will be like a very gentle experience but i am completely all for it 
there seems to be something in the system that keeps us on one channel. And I, you know, I just to ask the community, those are great questions. And even to ask the question, you know, if the, if the questioner wants to ask again, what is their own thoughts about why do you seem to be on this one channel? Everyone will say, well, because there's a time, there's a time asymmetry and the past is irreversible. Well, we've seen how shady irreversibility is, right? It's a boundary phenomenon. And so you almost have to be like, somebody called me Miss Frizzle once, <laughs> like the magic school bus lady. I was like, okay, this is great. She's got like red hair and she's driving this school bus, like <laughs> going into these things. I would totally take a school bus and go into the, the alveoli. Like, what is this place? If you were to actually drive the school bus into the actual boundary, you're going to see it's not there. I mean, it is because you can hear me like hitting the table. It is to on um, this channel. But if we were actually like able to access the multi channels, you know, I'm not sure. Is time travel possible? Yeah, you're going to have to partition awareness, not partition the brain because you would be very sick and I don't want to lose you. <laughs> um, you cannot, you know, but try to think of why this whole interface and why embodied cognition is here for one channel. Like, can we actually have a multi, and that's what I was saying, can we actually have like a three embodied cognition, you know? What do you think about time travel, Dan, or any of that? Sorry if that was too wild, everyone, but I'm getting excited. You know? <laughs> Good question. Um, I have I've heard a few different ways it could happen. Yeah. And I uh, would love to see evidence it could. Yeah, evidence it could. And that's why, you know, you can look to... Um, so, you know, as free as I am in the math space and I'm open and I want to travel because I want, you know, humans to like succeed and, you know, uh, yeah, I want or I want organic life to continue. I'm very worried about that. So whatever we can do, let's let's try to keep it going. Um, and then, uh, you know, something to help the questioner also is like this great work. It'll be coming out soon by Levin and Fields about, you know, um, decoherence is actually localized to intercompartmental boundaries. Right. Where is it not? Okay, so if the internal bulk states of daughter cells may remain entangled for macroscopic times following cell division, so you have little pockets of time travel, right? If you have entanglement. And so there is like hope if there is entanglement in the biological setting. Um, again, most people may think their work is like, you know, to future thinking or whatever, but I'm super future thinking. Like, let's try to figure this out, you know? Um, lots of ramifications. You know, this theory of extended mind, this philosophy theory, I thought was actually like really great. Andy Clark, right? Um, you know, if you're operating through time as these series of dots, you're going to have something called a singular support. You've got, I, I'm really curious how, how you remember a memory, right? So again, if, if the whole point of shared action is to get these morphisms between morphisms, um, you know, when the questioner asked, is it possible that your now is a, you know, like a collection of other nows? Well, absolutely. You're probably operating in a nested space, right? Of a, like a, a perturbative, profinite um, memory of a memory, right? So you start having these meta memories, memory of memory. And it's very interesting. You're like, oh, I know what a cat looks like. And then I see it again. That is my cat. It's very interesting how you link that. So something as simple as object persistence, right, is actually everywhere. Time is not a total order. Right. Um, and how do you actually relate all this stuff? Um, great. <laughs> I, I should probably go in about like five minutes because I have a class, but I wanted to actually show. Oh, I have unicorns everywhere. Right. So there's magic. I'm like, how would you. So the, the another main takeaway for the math, take away the diamonds and the sheaves and all this stuff is also the notion of a reciprocity law. These are really beautiful. Reciprocity laws connect seemingly different branches of mathematics. So like in the Langlands program, connecting uh, these certain Galois representations, which is one branch of math, with automorphic forms, which is like, you know, harmonic analysis. Like that is beauty, right? That's actually kind of synesthetic at a certain point. And I think since I am kind of like synesthetic, but I align with these sort of grand unified theories, I'm like, oh, that feels like home. Like that feels right. To be siloed, like doesn't feel right. Still be individual, but also be able to uh, connect in these like reciprocity laws. So how would you actually have a reciprocity law of emergent time? That actually means you're able to link emergent time with Newtonian time, string theory time, alveoli time, the time of C of CO2 and O2 um, exchange, right? How do you actually how do you actually relate all of those times? Quantum time, everybody's time, no time, darkroom time, uh, the time before existence, that kind of like long like Christ consciousness time, all the times, right? That's huge. And that's why I said, well, I don't know. I put a big unicorn on there because it's going to be some magic. <laughs> so it'll take some magic to actually get a law of time. But you've got great heavyweights trying to work on that. 
um, you know, uh, like emergent theories of time are like tricky and they're hard, you know? So if you have this like new reciprocity law, if you actually could connect the diamonds and like, you know, I'm really, everyone knows, and um, I'm really interested in like the mirror framework. If mirror phenomena are actually how you're interacting. So when people say, well, what is the now? Is it just your mirror system imitation? And then Daniel, I wanted to ask your community and you, what is your interpretation of like, if you believe in mirror neurons or the actual mirror system that learns by imitation? Because that's very, very powerful, right? We were talking about stuff like that. So um, just wanted your thoughts on the mirror framework and uh, the mirror framework in terms of like these hidden states as well. It's a great question. I'd be curious to know what uh, different hypotheses the mirror neuron helps us get at, what different observations in the world we could actually test. For example, does somebody who's not looking, but they're feeling someone else move, maybe does that, I'm just curious about it, don't have the answers. Although in general, I'd mm -hmm. say adding an adjective, like, oh, it's the Jennifer Aniston neuron, it's the mirror neuron, it's like, okay, but that's a reductionist take because it's labeling the uh, neuron. So right. if it turns out that we have a dynamic distributed function in our mm -hmm. brain that does mm -hmm. have action models of ourself as well as action models of others, and maybe there mm -hmm. are some firing patterns that are overlapping, but there's probably some action patterns only if you're watching someone else and only mm -hmm. if you're moving or every other combination. So I just think mm -hmm. it's one of the facets of the I brain like diamond, and it's not mm -hmm. um, the whole picture. I like that. Yeah. See, and once again, right, even like even having this very strange like little piece that's this mirror thing. I just know I was watching um, uh, someone, um, you know, uh, like another heavyweight give this talk about this and the sort of the phantom limb syndrome and stuff like that. Right. If your limb is lost and someone else is maybe like, you know, touching the same limb that you lost, you sort of feel that. And there's like and these people aren't even kind of empath like like me you know they're, they're not like me coming up with stuff like this they're like you know less hyperbolic i would say but um they so uh it was interesting then the neurologist i was actually happy to hear him kind of go do a shared action kind of thing said uh you know it seems that the only thing that separates us is the skin because if i can feel what you can feel you can feel what i can feel everything is imitation then it seems to be like this skin boundary and then again boundaries are Profinite and not ontic, right? So you know that had me perplexed. So I appreciate your answer there. Yeah. Um, okay. I think I've already talked about most of this. The topological localization. So when I said, you know, you can put a, you know, a topology, I said you could put a sheaf on a category. Well, uh, everyone should also think how you actually could put a topology on an infinity one category. So I'm working on something like that. That's actually really tricky. You have to figure out what the open sets are in an infinite a category with infinite morphisms, you know. So this sort of condensed framework that I was talking about, um, I'll wrap up with this. So you have this notion, I'd said the condensed framework was a sheaf over a point. So if we talk about a site, so remember I told you the site is the place where you can actually put a topology. So we call, um, Peter and, and Dustin call this the Proetel site of a point is the category of profinite sets S <clears throat> with finite jointly surjective families of maps as covers. Uh, a condensed set, it's a sheaf of sets on this site. So on this site, right? So it's a sheaf of sets over a point, but on the point, is the category uh, of profinite sets. So you already have that kind of multi-scale in this sort of point. So you do have sheaves over a point, but the point has the site of profinite sets. So you can do this to condensed ring. If this, this is all about trying to do the same algebra and mathematics you've always done. But when your objects actually carry a topology, that's what's interesting, all of the objects. So reframe everything, like the six tuple and active inference, put a topology on it have all of your algebraic things, modules, groups, rings, carry topology. How do you do stuff with that? Um, okay, so that's fine. That's fine. The way that you can associate this, <clears throat> you take T to be any topological space. To T, there is an associated condensed set, T underline. You saw the underline in the spot of QP, the spot of QP silk atomic mod uh, Galois action with the underline that I showed you earlier. Um, this is defined by sending any profinite S to the set of continuous maps from S to T. So that's what you're trying, that's how you can associate to any topological space a condensed set. So how beautiful is that? So you can reframe, if you have stuff in terms of topology, we can bulldoze it, well, I shouldn't say bulldoze, that's a little extreme, <laughs> reframe it in terms of these condensed if you want to get this very interesting uh, 
sort of a sheaf over a point. And then you can do like the weird thing that I was saying, put a formal, formal spectra around it to make it a little like a little thicker. Um, okay, so to actually consider this emergent time, what I, what I said, let's consider the simplest case, an event, um, you know, which is like a truncated perturbation, something like that, a topological localization of any particular reference frame. So that means I'm in the now, I am staring at my reflections, whatever that is. Um, let's take an event to be a point in the diamond topological space, T. We're gonna actually convert this to a condensed set. On that point is the Proetel site, uh, the category for finite sets. So here we go. This global time maybe emerges as a set of continuous maps from all profinite sets S to T, because I said the individual time is diamond, which is profinite. So if time, if global time is constructed as the sheaf of sets on this site um, as a condensed set, right, then emergent time is going to result in passing to the larger category of sheaves, right? So we just keep talking about sheaves on categories. Let's talk about like the larger, let's just frame it all in the category of sheaves. And you can consider a condensed version of this continuous K theory. This is so hard um, and it'll take me a bit to finish it. But as soon as I make a little progress, I get excited. A second way to get emergent time is to take those, like if, if, if condensed time is local time, let's take you know, uh, equivalence relations of those. Take it your multi-scale active inference again, and you can actually take diamond equivalence relations to get the B stacks and I already went over that. So I made up, I came up with this like dictionary between ordinary quantum mechanics and perfectoid quantum mechanics upgrade the Hilbert space, which is a sort of like, you know, complete inner product space. Let's make it a perfectoid space, right? The sort of strange uh, fractal space. Replace, you know, state vectors with the geometric points, the tensor product with the diamond product. The non-locality phenomena, maybe it's the profinitely many copies of Spa C. If you have that many reflections, uh, you, know, you don't know which one is the reference point. You can, uh, the wave function collapses this tilting, the coupling behavior, right? Holographic principle, you know, quantum topology, replace it with this Attel cohomology of diamonds. Take your operator algebra and replace it with a non Noetherian complete evaluation ring. Um, uh, unitarity, pro Attel descent datum, or that diamond descent. That's great. Okay. So I will end there and say thank you. So, you know, I mentioned everyone working together and you see there's giraffe, elephant, baby unicorn, unicorns, everyone is working together here. And there's some like zero sharp on the board and a spot of QP diamond. <laughs> so, <laughs> I should stop there. Yeah. And take other questions. Yeah. <laughs> we'll let you head off to your class in just a minute, but this was mm -hmm. very thought provoking and interesting. So I hope that um, people will ask you questions in the meanwhile. And then uh, I'm sure there'll be more math streams in our future. That's wonderful. And then um, does everyone have my email? I guess they do on the, um... I mean, I'm findable. The... Yeah. <laughs> anyone can always get in touch with Active Lab to contact a guest. Okay. Or if you send us a link that you want us to put in the video description, then we'll mm -hmm. add that there. But I think okay. we're all going to uh, go home, go back, hit the books. And uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed doing it live. I do too. This was so fun. And I think like maybe the next talk would be like, a, it'd be fun to do these thought experiments, right? Like what if? It, what if? Could have... Let's actually pose the question of dark room and how we use active inference and this math to get out of it. <laughs> you know? I'd, I'd uh, suggest a event format where we have multiple different backgrounds and perspectives. And then we give people the prompts and the thought questions. And then we do have a spontaneous conversation about how different perspectives lead to different views on the thought questions. Oh, that sounds so great. Okay. Yes. Well, thank so you. So whoever so, wants so to much. join, whoever wants to join, you're always welcome. Yeah. So thank you again. And we'll see you later. Thank you so much.